I want to welcome you to this webinar offered by the Soul Repair Center. And our webinar today, as you know, is titled Jewish Resources for Caring for Service Persons and Veterans Affected by Military Moral Injury. I'm Nancy Ramsey, Director of the Soul Repair Center at Bright Divinity School on the campus of TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. The center seeks to provide resources for religious leaders and professional caregivers who support veterans and their families affected by moral injury. Our mission includes offering free monthly webinars that further that mission with a focus on topics that have been inadequately covered or not yet addressed. We're grateful for the support of the Shea Center on Moral Injury at Volunteers of America, which co-sponsors these webinars. The center is led by Dr. Rita Nakashima Brock, who served as the founding director of the Soul Repair Center. The Soul Repair Center is intentionally interreligious in its focus on identifying effective resources and practices to support healing for those affected by military moral injury. This webinar is led by three rabbis who are deeply informed about military moral injury, its particular implications for Jewish service persons and veterans, and practices for responding to all those experiencing moral injury. Our panelists include an active duty Navy chaplain Lieutenant Commander Emily Rosenzweig, and two scholars with clinical expertise, Professors Nancy Weiner and Kim Geringer, whose teaching at Hebrew Union College in New York features resources and strategies for responding to military moral injury. These three panelists will acquaint viewers with resources in Jewish scriptures and texts that are helpful in addressing experiences of military moral injury not only for Jewish service persons, but more broadly, including its rich liturgical and ritual practices. Our presenters are also members of the Soul Repair Center's National Advisory Board. We appreciate the assistance of Kyle Fauntleroy, now Director of Development at Bright and former Captain in the US Navy, who is a founding member of the National Advisory Board at the Center and the production expertise of Sam McAllister at Volunteers of America. A link for this webinar will be available at this site in 10 days to two weeks, and previous webinars are available at the tab accessible on the Soul Repair Center webpage. Our webinar will proceed with presentations by our panelists and then opportunity for conversation among them. After the first hour, we'll turn to questions and comments that you share on the chat. These will focus the conversations for the last 25 minutes or so. We'll close with a brief concluding resource offered by our speakers. I also want to invite you to attend our next webinar a month from today, March 16th, in which we'll address practices of care for unhoused veterans affected by military moral injury. Now let's give our attention to our three panelists. Thank you, Nancy. I'll uh, begin. I think as, uh, as we're sharing uh, our presentation here. Uh, the first question, just really, who are we talking about? Uh, who are the Jews in the military today? I think uh, it's helpful to understand that we're talking about 1% of the military, uh, which reflects generally the Jewish population in America is about 1%, so that is reflective. Uh, and we're really talking about people from across the Jewish spectrum. So that is folks who are uh, who have grown up in, in a traditional or an orthodox Torah observant household and have for one reason or another left that world. Uh, all the way from that end of the spectrum to folks who I would call uh, heritage Jews or genetic Jews, which is to say they know they have a grandparent who's Jewish or perhaps even a parent who's Jewish but have no uh, really grounding within the Jewish world. And so really talking about a broad spectrum of people. Uh, the majority of them, though, I would say fall into uh, one of the more, maybe the more liberal end of the Jewish spectrum, so uh, reform conservative Judaism, uh, which is to say that they are probably somewhat knowledgeable, they are probably somewhat observant of Jewish rules, uh, and they are somewhat conversant in Jewish language, um, by which I don't mean Hebrew, but uh, Torah as opposed to Bible, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I would, from a military context, we're really talking about everybody from uh, the most junior enlisted guy who's running the hazmat 
uh, office, you know, the check in and check out hazmat stuff, uh, infantry person that level to uh, very senior specialized officers in the medical field or intelligence field or something like that. So really, you'd find uh, military per Jewish military personnel across uh, all of the branches uh, and all of the uh, sort of roles within the military. Do you want to mention for a brief moment that uh, we should also consider the role of the Jewish spouse? Uh, not something that gets a lot of uh, mention, but I have met a lot of service members who are married, who are not Jewish themselves, but are married to somebody Jewish, uh, and they may or may not be raising their children uh, in a, in Judaism, uh, but. It is the language, again, the religious cultural practice of the spouse. And so uh, there's that, uh, that component also. Uh, just as an example, uh, when I first got to uh, the uh, aircraft carrier that I was uh, stationed with uh, in my last setting, uh, there were five people who attended regularly the Jewish service, uh, one Jewish service member, and uh, four dentists, I don't know why, all of whom had some connection, were in some sort of relationship with somebody who was Jewish, but none of them were Jewish. So uh, if it's true on the Nimitz, it must be true elsewhere, I think. Uh, so that's one, uh, one aspect. The other one uh, that I wanted to make sure we talked about uh, was the notion that, uh, and I should say particularly, it's not historically accurate, but it is, I think, ingrained the notion that uh, the military is a place to assimilate Jews or a mechanism to assimilate Jews. This comes, there is some historical context for it, it comes from uh, the use of military service, let's say in czarist Russia, uh, that Jewish boys went away and never came back to their Jewish families because they were uh, Russified also not a word, but please forgive me. Uh, that cultural memory, I think, is maintained into the American Jewish population, even though uh, Jews fought in the Revolutionary War and they fought in every conflict and have been in the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps for however long. Uh, there's still a notion that a good Jewish kid, boy, girl, whatever, doesn't join the military uh unless something has gone horribly wrong uh so by which i mean college or other things so i uh, in my time at the navy's boot camp uh one of the conversations i had with a jewish recruit was my parents think i'm a bad jew for being in the military uh now what that uh what that means in terms of uh, his own relationship with God, with the Jewish community, all of those things is gets a little complicated in that personal, in that story. But uh, he came into his military service with a little bit of moral distress, right? Am I wrong for even being here? Uh, and so that's a, one of the questions that I've, I've tried to keep in my mind when dealing with uh, not only Jewish service members, but service members in general. Uh, how did they get here and what do they think of being here? Uh, so those were the points uh, that I wanted to raise uh, as an introduction to Jews in the military. Uh, turn it over to my uh, co-panelists. Great. Um, what we'd like to do next is introduce you to some fundamental Jewish teachings. Uh, the first is that we are all given by God a pure soul, uh, and that that soul is something that is in our keeping, and that every day, uh, no matter the day of the year, uh, part of the liturgy in the morning is to affirm that pure soul that we have, and that it is our connection with God. Another teaching is that we are all created in God's image. In Hebrew, the phrase is B'Tselem Elohim. We base this on the verses in Genesis that 
read, and God said, let us make human beings in our image after our likeness and let them hold sway over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the beasts, over all the earth, over all that creeps upon the earth. So God created human beings in the divine image, creating them in the image of God in Hebrew, B'Tselem Elohim. In later Jewish writings, we then have this notion interpreted and underscored in different ways. Uh, in Pirkei Avot, the sayings of the fathers, beloved is the human being for they were created in the image of God. Still greater was God's love in that God gave to them the knowledge of their having been so created. And so just having been created in God's image is not the most wondrous part of this, but that we're aware of it. And therefore it's something that we hold and aspire to nurture and bring into our daily lives as much as possible. That said, uh, we understand human beings as having dual inclinations. We have an inclination towards good and an inclination towards bad. Um, in Hebrew, yetzer hatov and yetzer hara. Judaism affirms that every human being is born with both a yetzer hatov, a good inclination or an impulse to do good, and a yetzer hara, an inclination or impulse to do evil. Acting on the yetzer hara, a human's actions can stray from the desired path, just as an arrow can veer off and miss its target. No human being can live a life without having times when their yetzer hara is expressed and holds sway. As we're told in the Talmud, everything is determined by heaven except one's fear of heaven. And so the rabbis explain this as everything being in a person's life is predetermined by God, except the choice to be righteous or not, which is left to each of our own free will. Many contemporary Jews don't accept the first part of this rabbinic dictum that everything is predetermined, but there is a general acceptance of the idea that we do have free will and that the choice of how we act in any given situation is left to us. Um, in Ecclesiastes, this idea is uh, repeated for there's not a righteous person upon earth who does only good and does not err. And so it's the nature of being human that we will do things that are righteous and we will do things that are harmful. Another Jewish teaching that we would like to introduce you all to today is our understanding of the covenants that God has made with humanity and with Jews. Uh, all of humanity has a covenant with God through Noah. As we read in Genesis 8, never again will I bring doom upon the world on account of what people do. Though the human mind inclines to evil from youth onward, never again will I, God speaking, destroy all living beings as I have done. And so we recognize all of humanity as having been part of this initial covenant made by God with Noah. And that as a collective, all humanity has an obligation to maintain the world and to make sure that all um, that is part of the creative world is honored and sustained. We also believe that God has a covenant with the Jewish people. As we read, when Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk along with me and be pure of heart and I will set a covenant between us and multiply you exceedingly. In response to that, Abraham, Abram fell on his face and God spoke with him saying, as for me, here is my covenant with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of peoples. No longer are you to be called Abram. Your name is to be Abraham, for I have make, am making you the father of a multitude of nations. And it continues, I will establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you for all of their generations an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. 
I will give you and your descendants after you the land where you have sojourned the whole land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. These two covenants, the covenant made with Noah and the covenant made with the Jewish people are both enduring and one does not supersede the other. Even with this covenant, we continue as humans to uh, have those two inclinations. And so part of the way that the covenants are continuous is that they aren't broken when we engage in human error. Rather, the covenant that God makes with us is that there will be a way for us to recover from those errors. As we read in Ezekiel, say to them, as I live, declares the eternal God, it is not my desire that the wicked shall die, but that the wicked turn from their evil ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways that you may not die, O house of Israel. And in Exodus, in a Midrash, we read, the Holy One declares no creature unfit. God receives all. The gates of repentance are always open and one who wishes to enter may enter. This teaching extends throughout one's life up until the moment of their death. And so a lot of what we want to be looking at today are the ways in which human error um, is addressed in the Jewish tradition, because we see these as key ways for us to be thinking of how we can work best with those who are suffering from moral injury and how they might utilize teachings from within the Jewish tradition to do so. The first one is tefillah. So tefillah, okay. Um, tefillah is the Hebrew word for prayer or worship. Uh, the word itself contains a range of meanings. The Hebrew root means to think, entreat, judge, or intercede. And the verb to pray in Hebrew is a reflexive verb referring to the act of inspecting or examining oneself. And Jewish communal worship offers opportunities for individual and collective prayer. Okay. Um, we saw this. Uh, we saw this earlier. Um, this is a prayer from our morning liturgy. Again, Elohai Nishamash and Atata Bi Tahorahi. And the significance again is the notion that in Judaism we believe that individuals are born with a pure soul, and this is a prayer of gratitude and appreciation uh, and thanks to God for creating us with a pure soul. Okay. This is the Vidui Zuta or short confession, which is recited um, on uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. A couple of things that are particularly important to notice here. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a delineation of wrongdoing. Um, in Judaism, um, we have to we have to name what we're confessing um, and be specific about it, and this is an opportunity um, to note um, a list a list of wrongdoing. Of these wrongs, we are guilty. We say we betray, we steal, we scorn, we act perversely, we are cruel, and so forth. You'll also notice that this prayer, as the great majority of Jewish prayer, is, is in the plural. We say we and us, not I and me and uh, my. Um, this, uh, this is um, a way of thinking about wrongdoing that acknowledges that none of us stands alone in wrongdoing, that everyone is capable uh, of, of misdeeds, and um, we are not singling out individuals, um, uh, nor do we think that uh, this kind of error is, um, is not uh, the work of everybody. Uh, this is um, a section of um, our uh, daily liturgy, the Amidah, all right? 
known as the daily standing prayer. These are some excerpts. And you'll notice the emphasis here on um, repentance. Um, we pray, return us, this is us speaking to God, return us to your Torah and draw us to your service in complete repentance. Restore us to your presence. We're thanking God. We're saying to God, we are grateful that you are a God who welcomes repentance. And then the next one, we continue again, we asking for forgiveness. And again, remember in the plural, forgive us for we have sinned, pardon us for we have transgressed for you pardon and forgive. And again, we are saying to God, we are so grateful that you are a God who abounds in forgiveness. Okay. Um, in in recent years, creative Jewish ritual makers um, have taken some of Judaism's most ancient rituals and have recontextualized them and shaped them in new ways for new purposes. So following, I wanna show you two examples of this, uh, the use of the mikvah and then the, um, the notion of changing one's name, but first the mikvah, okay. Um, a mikvah, uh, immersion for spiritual purification, rather than for the purpose of cleansing the body, is one of Judaism's most ancient rituals. And since biblical times, um, communities have built a pool with flowing water for this specific purpose, and this pool is known in Hebrew as a mikvah. Here's a couple of pictures. Well, this is a very ancient uh, mikvah. Um, these have been found and uh, uncovered really all over the world, wherever Jews uh, have lived. So this is an ancient mikvah. Here's a, um, a more contemporary one. Um, traditionally, uh, both men and women have immersed in a mikvah uh, as part of the process of converting to Judaism. Uh, women have immersed in a mikvah when observing the laws of marital purity, and men uh, might immerse prior to the Sabbath, uh, to the Day of Atonement, and before their and before their weddings. So what's really important here to note is that immersion in a ritual bath, a mikvah, has been used to mark significant life transitions, moments when individuals move from one personal status to another. So recent years have seen an expansion of the definition of significant life transitions to include uh, such events as healing from trauma or illness or other losses. And so this, what's just come up on the screen now is a contemporary mikvah based ritual that could be used in a program of healing from moral injury. Um, <clears throat> so um, this imagines a person who wishes to immerse in a mikvah as part of a course of um, transformation and healing, um, preparing to walk into the ritual bath, the mikvah, and offer seven kavanot or preparatory meditations before entering the water. Um, and here they are, um, starting with I mean, the Holy One created the world in six days, but made it complete on Shabbat, the seventh day. The number seven suggests wholeness, completion, and perfect peace. Seven steps lead into a mikvah. And so seven kavanot are offered prior to immersion. And each one of these kavanot or preparatory meditations um, um, is emphasizing a particular truth or value in Judaism. Number one, hineni, here I am. Immersion in the mikvah represents a spiritual transformation from one state to another, from ritually unready, tame in Hebrew, to ritually ready, tahor. The person says, I am ready. Two, chidur mitzvah, which means beautifying the commandment. We're saying there's no need for adornment or artifice in the mikvah. 
There will be no physical barriers between my body and the living waters. Nikavim, Nikavim, you fashion the human being intricate in design. This is taken from our liturgy. Our tradition celebrates and blesses the body in every possible moment and state of being. Okay, there we go. Um, fourth one, B'Tselem Elohim, you heard that a little while ago. I am made in the image of God. Each person enters the mikvah as naked as the day of birth, without rank or status, simply a human being. Gloriously a human being, I will emerge as from the womb of God. And again, imagine someone in need of healing, um, reciting these meditations to themselves as they prepare to enter the water, seeking the power and the beauty of water as a transformative agent. Five. The soul that God has given me is pure. At my essence, at my core, I am a perfect vessel. I prepare to be enveloped by the sweet waters of the mikvah. The breath of every living thing praises God. May my breath, my words, my song be a reflection of your light within me. And then the final truth, tikkun olam, meaning repair of the world. I consider the power of my hands and feet to create wholeness in my life and in our world. We can stand for justice. We can build a world of righteousness and peace. Okay. I'm going to read this because it's a little, it's a little small, maybe um, hard to see. So in Judaism, a change of a name ceremony was traditionally done for a seriously ill person in order to, it was said, deflect the attention um, of the angel of death that might be hovering around the sick person. So changing one's name symbolically represents a desired change in status, say moving from um, a place of sickness to a place of health, from a place of brokenness to a place um, of wholeness. And by the way, I'll remind you that um, in the Bible, God gives new names to Abraham, to Sarah, and to Jacob at momentous moments in their lives when their lives dramatically change. So we imagine um, uh, recontextualizing this old ceremony of adopting a new name for someone um, seeking healing from a state of brokenness. Um, and I imagine this ritual as um, uh, the, uh, the individual um, seeking healing, um, who in this, in, in this um, ceremony I named Sharon, and being with um, a group of supportive people. And the ritual would go like this. Um, the leader saying, beyond our names, beyond the sounds made to call us, the symbols used to evoke us, there is a soul pulsing with life, electrified, animated with perception and perspective. Each soul is a glimpse of Elohim, God. Beyond our place, beyond what others call us or what we once have called ourselves, the soul may speak. In speaking, the soul may express a new name, a new arrangement of sounds and forms, a new symbol to declare itself. And I want to suggest to all of you who are with us, that if you're muted, you recite, recite with me the section for all. Okay, so let's say together, today a soul prepares to speak, we prepare to listen. Okay, now I'm the leader again. In the midst of loving community, the name is affirmed. As God may be called by many names, so we who are created, but Selim Elohim in the image of God, may be called in countless ways. And all those present, that's all of you, we say together, we call and we are heard, we are called and we answer, amen. And now, the person I imagine I call Sharon, who is in search of healing, Sharon says, I am, she's renaming herself Raphaela, meaning God is my healer. My name is an expression of my gratitude to God for the continued healing of my soul. 
and all those present with Sharon say, you are Rafaela, we hear you. And I conclude by saying, you are Rafaela, the sparks of Elohim, which reside in your soul, defy categories, titles, and labels. You are finite and you are infinite. You are welcome and you are safe. You are Rafaela. And again, these are examples of two ceremonies working from, um, from ancient rituals um, and um, recontextualizing them and, um, and using them in the service of, uh, of healing and moving from a place of brokenness to greater wholeness. Okay, Emily. Uh, well, Kim, thank you. Uh, I've not had a chance uh, to use either of these rituals uh, with Jewish service members uh, or any service members, although I think uh, both present really powerful physical ways uh, to put into action uh, or public ways to put into action uh, some of the internal processes we hope are happening as people heal. Um, what I did want to mention, and, and I think actually both are good examples of this uh, also, is the, the idea of being in relationship directly with God, I think is uh, something that is, um, it's not particularly Jewish, but uh, there's not any sort of intermediary in Jewish uh, prayer. And so, uh, any prayers that we offer are blessing God directly. Uh, and the reason I mention this is because uh, one of the expressions, I guess, of moral injury that I've heard from uh, many service members, particularly uh, women who've experienced uh, either childhood or military sexual trauma, is that they, are una they feel unable to speak to God. Uh, through prayer or in any other form. Uh, in part, uh, and this really surprised me, so I'll mention it. I don't, I don't think it's, I'm not breaking new ground here, I don't think, but uh, in part that comes from the emphasis that they internalized. Now, whether it was actually there or not, I don't know, but they internalized that their connection to God was dependent on their virginity. Um, and so I mentioned this again because it surprised me. It's not part of the Jewish, uh, let's say, contemporary liberal Jewish discussion about being in relationship to God, although it's certainly in our texts uh, that a virgin is a higher status or higher value um, in terms of women being owned. That's a whole nother, that's another webinar. Uh, but uh, I think the, that notion is somewhat counteracted, uh, at least I've used uh, the idea of being created but Selim Elohim in God's image, uh, and also being created with a pure soul. And also the, the, the notion that we all have an inclination uh, to do good and to be in communication with God and to be holy. Uh, I've used all three of those things with uh, service members, again, who have uh, felt uh, distanced from God, uh, either through their own actions or things they've experienced. Uh, so all, I hold all of those to be, uh, to be valuable in, uh, in real life. I guess I'm not sure what that means. Uh, but the other thing I would uh, just mention is that um, while there's, there's a great emphasis in Jewish uh, practice on communal prayer, there's also a very rich tradition of uh, individual prayer uh, and um, uh, lots of great examples throughout history that you can now buy a book of so-and-so's prayers. Um, but I have tended to try to use those uh, more than actually uh, instances for, or examples of communal liturgy. Um, because it feels to me like a muscle that's not real well developed um, in among Jewish young people uh, to be able to uh, pray, offer one's individual uh, thanks or needs or uh, 
just con words of, of relation of being in relationship with God. And so um, one example of that would be Nachman of Bratslav. Uh, I use his stuff all the time. Uh, in part because I grew up singing it and 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 knowing about it, but uh, he really speaks about uh, how to bring pain to God, how to bring joy to God, how to bring real life needs, uh, like how am I going to feed my family, uh, things like that, um, to your conversation with God. And so I, I would also encourage. Um, there are other examples as well, but Nachman of Bratslav is is perhaps the most accessible. Uh, I think for for folks. Um, Great, that would be my example uh, in terms of tefillah. We are going to move on to the second of the ways to address human error, which is teshuva. Teshuva is the Hebrew word for repentance, and it also means return. Teshuva is one means of atoning for wrongdoing. A Jewish penitent is traditionally known as a Baal Teshuvah, literally the master of repentance or the master of return. Judaism understands sin to be akin to missing the mark, as I mentioned earlier, similar to an arrow that goes astray of its target. Thus, the act of return or tshuva is the process of reestablishing and recentering oneself on a righteous path in order for the arrow to get closer to or hit its mark in the future. It's also understood as a commitment to returning to God in terms of the idea of return. In the Middle Ages, a uh, rabbi by the name of Moshe ben Maimon, otherwise known as Maimonides, uh, wrote extensively about repentance and isolated six stages of teshuva. Uh, the first is introspection and the recognition of one's wrongdoing. Uh, this can take place any time during one's life. It's not only right after something has occurred or even in a tight time frame, but it could be years and years later, as we've seen with moral injury, where people's memories, sometimes decades later, sort of blindside them, and suddenly there's a level of recognition and introspection about what they've done that needs to be addressed. And so while there's the possibility of somebody externally reminding somebody of something that they've done um, that's caused for them to engage in repentance or teshuva, the work according to Jewish tradition that is essential is not having that external reminder, but having something internally um, occur so that the process for change and growth uh, can take place within an, an individual. Once that has begun, the next step is for the person to engage in confession. Uh, as was mentioned, we don't have a role for a rabbi as confessor. Um, rather, the confession is made to someone else, not necessarily a rabbi, um, but it's a public confession of some sort, um, where, as was also mentioned with the liturgy, it's not a general, I know I did something wrong, but a very specific, these are the things that I did that were wrong that I feel I need to name in order to be able to both accept the rebuke or the penalty that will come with what I've done, but also in order for my own transformation and process of repentance and returning to the right path and returning to God. The third step is that repentance. And in the biblical time period, the process of atonement involved bringing sacrifices and guilt offerings. Uh, in the absence of that in the contemporary world, the, the corollary would be what somebody feels that they would be bringing um, in order to make amends, in order to right the wrong in some way. The next, those two th things, the repentance and atonement are not the end of the process. 
they are an essential building blocks for one to reach what is known as full repentance. How do we know that somebody reaches full repentance is one of the questions that Maimonides asks. And he says, once those first three steps are taken, it's finding yourself in a similar situation and being able to reject the lure of whatever that sin is and not repeat it. Once you've gotten to that level, the next challenge is being able to forgive yourself and to recognize that you were human and that you have the possibility of changing and becoming and living to be the person that you'd like to be. And to seek that forgiveness from others. And finally, at the end of all of this, there's a sense of renewal of having returned to that pure soul that you were given at birth and to being able to transform yourself and yourself in the world so that you can become part of the community that brings righteousness into the world and transforms the world, contributing, as was mentioned in uh, the section on tefillah, to the uh, repair of the world, to tikkun olam. I want to spend a couple of moments talking about the category in the Bible that's mentioned in both Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy 19 of the unintentional manslayer. Uh, and the fact that this person was recognized as having done something that they did not want to do um, and had not premeditatedly done in any way. Um, that it resulted in the death of another human being. And there were cities that were set up that were identified as cities in the ancient land of Israel that were designated as the cities where there would be Levites or priests. Six of those were set aside and designated as cities of refuge to which an unintentional manslayer could go. And there find an opportunity to both recognize what they had done and then move into a world where they would have a chance to start again and to be surrounded by a community that would be helping them do that and where they weren't going to be plagued by the associations other people had with them of there having been a manslayer. The fact that the Levites were there and that there was a way for them to connect with God and the religious community and to also be able to engage in the life of the community uh, was, is for us, I think, a model of what we can be offering people um, when they're suffering from moral injury to recognize the places in our world that can function as cities of refuge where they are not being told they didn't do anything, but that that's not, doesn't have to be the thing that defines them for the rest of their lives and that they can move forward and make a life where they feel that they are contributing and that they are being seen as a, a, a full member of the community. Yeah, so here I would uh, offer, first of all, Nancy, I, lo I love that idea. We should, let's write a grant. Let's let's make some cities of refuge in the, in the world. But uh, here I would um, offer an, another teaching that I believe is from Maimonides, at least I hope it is, because I've been claiming it is. Uh, I couldn't find the actual source, but uh, in his uh, teachings about how to make tshuva, how to, to uh, affect this, uh, he says that one should use the same um, mechanism or, or part of the body uh, to atone for the wrongdoing that you used in the wrongdoing. So if you used uh, inappropriate words, your atonement needs to take the form of words. If you are, if you punch somebody in the face, you can't just use words. You need to somehow help them 
with your hands, I guess, let's say it that way. Uh, and so I have used that um, with folks who are dealing with uh, some degree of moral injury, uh, not that they can necessarily get back into the same uh, setting that they were uh, injured in, but uh, to say what from that experience can you use as to, to tie your acts of atonement uh, with the act that caused, that was the transgression in your mind. Um, so uh, very minor example, uh, but in dealing with somebody who, uh, well, not so minor, actually, that was maybe the wrong word. Uh, some, uh, I had a service member who will essentially felt like he um, allowed the death of another person in a vehicle. Uh, leave aside the details. Uh, and so I encouraged him to think, well, what can you do in terms of cars that will uh, allow you to do good in the world? Um, whether it's driving uh, for the, uh, to bring somebody who's housebound a meal or whether it's uh, doing something else along those lines. So that notion that uh, however we, harm the world, that's how we ought to be fixing it. Um, and so I, I found that, that that really resonates with folks um, with the limitations of something in combat, obviously you can't necessarily be in that particular situation again. So finding some uh, parallels. Great. Um, Tzedakah is the, um, the final of our three um, means to Jewish healing that we want to share with you this afternoon. Uh, tzedakah has come to connote giving charitable contributions, but the term originates in another realm because the word tzedakah comes from the Hebrew word tzedek or justice. So in Jewish thought and practice, material support for those in need is not a matter of charity, which is a term that implies optional generosity dependent on the kindness of the donor, but rather a religious obligation rooted in behavior, both righteous and required. So here are some tzedakah options. Um, open to those who wish to use this modality as part of a process of healing, such as monetary contributions to individuals or organizations, doing volunteer work or pro bono work using one's professional expertise, um, organizing educational opportunities, writing op-ed pieces, doing public speaking, support for fellow veterans individually or in groups, um, perhaps in some of the ways that Emily was just uh, referencing, uh, donation of goods, political activism, fundraising, and of course, I mean, really the possibilities are limitless. Uh, so I've actually, uh use this uh, idea of tzedakah, specifically the, uh, the notion that in, at least in Jewish law, even someone who receives tzedakah is required to also give tzedakah, right? Obviously the expectations are different, but uh, I've actually used this to encourage participation in uh, group therapy or group uh, combat groups, combat veterans groups, uh, for folks who, who say, well, I'm not going to get anything out of it, or, well, I don't, you know, I'm not going to share my stuff with other people. Well, it's, it is a gift to other people for you to be there hearing them. And if you are also getting something out of it, then guess what? It's that give and take, even the recipient has to, is required to give tzedakah. Uh, so that's the, the first notion or the first connection I make there. The second one is uh, that one of the things I try to remind folks uh, as they are checking out of uh, the battalion here and it oftentimes uh, leaving military service is that there are any number of ways to serve, uh, all of which can be valuable. Uh, and so I think we tend to 
certainly within the military, we tend to put a certain a higher value of military service um, or higher value on military service than on other ways of being involved in one's community. And I think that uh, the notion that one can continue to serve, continue to give to others, even after taking off the uniform uh, can be very empowering. Be and I know that in part because, or I believe that in part because they sit on my couch and their faces change when they hear that. Uh, that especially where I am now, folks, many of the folks are, are medically retired and they feel like they've missed their opportunity for service, uh, which is hard for many of them. Uh, not quite to the level of moral injury, but it does feel like a failure uh, on their part. And I try to encourage them uh, to see that they're, I mean, being a, you know, your kid's soccer coach is not perhaps the most valiant thing in the world, but given the right combination of children, I mean, it might be. So, uh, you know, that, that there are lots of ways to serve uh, and that everyone's required to. Okay, Nancy. Thank you all very much. I, um, this has just been extraordinary. And um, one of the things that I've been pondering um, is the ways in which the wisdom of the tradition that you've shared um, is accessible um, you know, in multiple contexts, certainly whether in a hospital, uh, in the context where you're serving now, Emily, with wounded warriors, uh, or any chaplain that's um, walking with uh, folks that have in, that um, report some sense of moral injury, either receptive or agential, um, uh, with the with the strat various strategies for uh, seeking healing from that and uh, new beginnings. I was particularly reflecting on words of Larry Graham in his uh, remarkable book, uh, Moral Injury, um, uh, Healing Wounded Souls, where he talks about uh, moral injury is not, um, that healing from moral injury is not innocence uh, restored, but, um, uh, moral integrity reestablished. And, and I was struck by the multiple ways that with the particularly the categories that you walked us through that um, in every case had the goal of um, uh, both reestablishing a sense of someone loved by God and in relation to the Holy One uh, and also um, the possibilities um, of being restored to right relation with one's neighbors. Um, and so part of what I, I hope we can talk about now, and, and I expect also when questions that, that um, we can continue to address uh, for the next probably 40 minutes would be um, uh, ways in which the two of you are involved in teaching in, um, uh, Jewish students, uh, some of whom I assume either be in chaplaincy, military or hospital or some other kind of chaplaincy or in serving congregations. And Emily, obviously for you in responding to um, current military personnel and, and um, in some cases veterans now. Um, so I, I do have some particular questions, but I wondered if you had any questions for each other before um, I share some, if there are things that either uh, any one of you said that the other wants to connect to, to, ex to elaborate. Well, um, maybe uh, not really something we said to hear, but um, Nancy, Kim, I know you, in previous writing, you've talked a lot about uh, that when someone uh, in the in the Israelites encampment, that when someone is found to be uh, uncle unclean, spiritually unclean in that context, that the notion that they go out of the uh, camp for a period of time, and then upon uh, completion of a ritual, there are, they re-enter. Uh, and it's not, 
Nancy Ramsey, what you just said made me think of this because it, it's not that they never were outside the camp or they never were unclean, but they come back in and they start again. Uh, their place in the community is reestablished. Uh, and I found that very helpful uh, framing for, uh, for some of the work around uh, helping someone think about moral injury, right? It's not that we're going to erase what's happened or forget mm -hmm. about it. It's that we're going to set you up uh, to start anew. Mm -hmm. And also part of that process was that while outside the camp, there was a way to access God through the oh, Moed that was outside the camp. Mm -hmm. And once they came in, there wasn't an expectation that they would immediately re-engage with everything, but that there would be a waiting period and that there, were, there, there, there was, well, people would see them and know that they were back, but not have expectations that they would be able to fully function as they might have before or hope to again afterwards. But there was a built-in buffer zone um, that we don't have, um, that really is um, incredibly wise to think about and really a challenge for us, I think, to be thinking about the ways in which people who have experienced moral injury in different ways need different stages of re-entry um, and that the, it's not just on them, but on the community to honor uh, the space that's needed. And actually, Emily, you, you said something very important. You said upon the completion of a ritual coming back. And I think that's very important to emphasize because what it says is that there has, the reentry has to be facilitated in a very intentional way. Um, and not just with an assumption that it's sort of allowed to happen and you hope for a good outcome, but that it's done with great care and thoughtfulness um, with a clear focus on where the person has been, where you are trying to help them to get to and using texts or rituals or ceremonies of some sort to make um, what is abstract in a way um, experienced in a concrete manner. And also all of these um, things that we've been talking about honor process mm -hmm. um, and really outline the process as you were saying, Kim, it's, it's the attention to detail and it's the um, intention that's not just understood by the person who is um, overseeing the ritual or the, the process, but that the participants and the observers are also brought into everything that's happening so that they can all understand the importance of each step of the process. You see that specifically in the detail around the how the cities of refuge are to be set up for unintentional manslayers, for instance, not something we had time to go into um, in detail today, but in the biblical text, I mean, these cities are set up with um, enormous attention to detail, um, roads and water systems um, and accessibility, for instance, and that all speaks to the need for detail and um, careful thought about the process. I, um, I wanted to, to pick up um, one of the, uh, one of the um, possibilities that there, there was a, a lot of interest, Kim, in response to your presentation on the mikveh. And um, I wondered if, as I was thinking about it, both for, um, Older veterans, um, for example, who uh, are back in a congregation, uh, but also for um, active duty uh, veterans. And I'm, um, I could see how this could be helpful. And I, I liked, um, I think I'm clear that part of what you're presenting was that this could be between um, a, a chaplain or a rabbi um, and, a, and a particular person 
or it might be that in conversation together, the person might want a community surrounding them. Am, am I correct it, that it, 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 could, it could work uh, in a more private way or in a, in a more communal way? I, I think, it, can you respond to that, Kim, just for clarity? Sure, I mean, um, the, the actual immersion <clears throat> um, is done um, privately, mm -hmm. usually with the person, just with the person who's immer immersing and a witness uh -huh. um, in some circumstances to make sure that the immersion has been done properly. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but certainly once someone, for instance, comes out of the mikvah and has completed the actual process of immersion, the idea then of a ceremony <clears throat> um, uh, being held, including other people, I think can be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And of course, you know, we know that water is a, is a transformative age of, agent in a, across mm -hmm. religious traditions, not just in Judaism. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities for using water um, mm -hmm. and the possibility of its... Um, um, uh, helping people feel that they are moving from one status to another status before they go in, they immerse, and that hopefully when they come out, there is a sense that they are coming out renewed mm -hmm. and different, or at least the beginning. Mm -hmm. In modern mikvahs today, um, there's often a space where family and friends can come with the person and then wait outside the bath mm -hmm. itself so that when the immersion is over, they're there to greet and celebrate with the person. So mm -hmm. it can be the mix of both the, the communal in anticipation right. of the dunking and then afterwards um, mm -hmm. to be there. I think I, I would also say that one of the things, reasons that I think mikvah is so powerful is that it's a physical embodiment of a psychological, mental, intellectual space, which is all, you know, necessary, but not sufficient. And so embodying the experience, um, I think has enormous, enormous power to um, extend a, um, a process. Expand and I would also, um, can I, sorry to cut you off, but I would also just add that uh, the mikvah requires living water and um, the ocean is living water. Um, and so it helps to be stationed in Hawaii, but uh, yeah. for the purpose of conversion, we, there's no uh, institutional mikvah in Hawaii. And so we, well, that works. And so uh, we use the ocean. Um, and that certainly um, has both the, the private uh, sort of being underneath the water singularly, but then returning to the beach and having everybody there. So mm -hmm. that, that would also work. One of the things that has, has struck me in, uh, in the presentation about the mikvah and the questions that uh, were, that were coming in on the chat um, was the ways in which it could be useful, certainly for persons who have experienced receptive moral injury, such as military sexual trauma, mm -hmm. and then have a different experience of their body. Yes. Uh, and, but also for persons who are struggling with agential moral injury and long for some felt experience of cleansing uh, as a part of, of, um, of repentance, of leaving that behind. And I'm, I'm curious, um, I know that um, each of you uh, has had um, congregational leadership uh, and, and Emily, you in particular have also worked with military personnel. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are brief uh, ways you might share further uh, where you've had um, this kind of dual possibility. I don't mean it the same with the same person, but um, ways in which it is an experience of receptive moral injury um, that has, you know, maybe deepened a sense of bodily shame. Um, or, uh, um, or the, the agential where it's, how can I ever uh, 
recover from what I've done to someone else. So I, I wondered if you could say a little bit more because I, I, I think this is extraordinarily powerful. So the first thing that comes to my mind is I have accompanied um, a congregant who was raped mm -hmm. um, and needed to have something that was physical and that helped her feel that beyond the, the formal ways that she had tried to cleanse herself after she was raped, mm -hmm. um, that there was a way for her to um, spiritually go through a process that enabled her to both feel more physically in touch with herself and more whole so that she could fully be participating in our community. Um, though the community was around her as soon as people became aware, um, it, she still didn't feel in a sense worthy enough or pure enough um, to fully be present when she was in the community until she went to Mecca. Mm -hmm. so. I, took, I took a group, well, twice, actually. I've taken a group of women in a Jewish women's study group that I've run, run for many, many years. Um, I took them to a mikvah, and many of them chose to immerse. And they had their own personal reasons for doing so, none of which they were required to um, share with the group. But a number of them... Um, said afterwards, I felt like I left something behind that I needed to leave behind there. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that in some of these cases, what they left behind was a sense of um, guilt or regret um, or sadness about something that they had done. Um, I never, I never failed to be reminded again and quite astounded by the power of this very, very ancient ritual where one is alone um, in the most elemental element, which is water. Um, a mikvah attendant uh, once said to me, um, you know why you have to take off all your jewelry and everything when you go into the mikvah, right? She said, because when you come out, it should be as if you are emerging from the womb of Hashem, God, All right? All right. Mm -hmm. Emily, have, can you say any, I mean, are there experiences or practices for you as a chaplain that touch on this, on this particular ritual that are, you've drawn on? Um, I, I'm... I'm not sure if I'm sorry to say or happy to say, but I, I've not actually had uh, the I've not had the opportunity to to use this ritual uh, with anyone I've worked with in a in a trauma setting. As I said, it, uh, for conversion, yes, but um, but I think the. Uh, what I, I have had the opportunity to do is to uh, some of the ideas that that were presented as part of the um, the kava notes, the the steps, things to think about as you're uh, on those steps down into the mikvah, mm -hmm. um, because it should be pointed out like you don't hop into the mikvah, you don't you know you, you don't slide in, you you intentionally uh, take those steps, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I have had the opportunity to to do use some of the similar ideas uh again that uh that one's entire body uh reflects the divine uh that is is created uh from it from that it, it is is essentially good and it, it can't be whatever we do to it doesn't change the fact that it is essentially uh, good and so we just have to come back into that belief for ourselves, uh, right? Um, so I, I, I have had, I have used that idea. Um, perhaps if there were more mikvot uh, on military basis, uh, I would, I would use it. But I think it can be very, it could be very powerful. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I want to, I want to emphasize what um, Emily said earlier is that. Um, 
these kinds of ceremonies can be done in any body of living of living water. All right, and um, the ocean is a very good place. Mm -hmm. like, and a river. And a river. And a river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> One of the things I'm struck by is how in the three Abrahamic traditions, water has this power. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I, I know, for example, Emily, that you're a chaplain for whomever presents. Um, and so the, the wisdom of being reminded of the power of this cleansing um, seems to me especially remarkable. Um, I'm also um, aware of, you know, um, how many in, in, in congregations of our traditions, uh, our three traditions, Abrahamic traditions, um, um, there are certainly veterans of Vietnam, uh, very few Korean veterans now, and certainly World War II, um, but um, I think there's been, a, uh, as we talked about um, earlier this year, um, a particular resonance for Vietnam veterans um, from the events of Afghanistan and uh, um, a renewed, probably for some, um, challenge about cleansing of uh, being set free from things that haunt. So I'm, I'm really uh, struck by the, um, you know, the wisdom of this and your opportunity in particular, Emily, to bring that wisdom with whatever personnel, whomever you're called to, to, to be present too. Um, I also wanted to ask, there was a lot of interest in the uh, teshuva, did I, or teshuva, did I pronounce that? Whew, that was lucky. Um, uh, but I, I'm interested if um, you could give some illustrations, some further illustrations. I'm, I'm thinking, um, uh, Emily, uh, I, I wonder if there's some safe way to talk about how knowledge of that ritual has informed your care with um, persons, you know, not only in your current location, but across your experience as a chaplain? Well, uh, part of it, I think, comes from, uh, I mean, one of the steps that um, the NC presented was that uh, we make a confession. Mm -hmm. uh, and when Kim presented the liturgy of our confession, uh, or one version of it, uh, she pointed out that it's, uh, it's said in the plural. Uh, and so one of the, uh, one of the things that I try to do when folks come to me with some, uh, something they've done wrong that they, that is weighing on them is I try to, uh, remind them that it doesn't lessen their responsibility, but they're probably not the first person to have experienced this. They probably will not be the last, that each of us has our own failings in some way. We, we uh, miss our own marks in some way. And so uh, that imagery uh, is, is very powerful um, for me uh, to work with, but then also I think for people to hear. Uh, right, because when you, when one has done something wrong, that's the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I therefore must be the worst person in the world. Well, actually, uh, we're all pretty bad. You know, I try to remind them of that. Uh, that's a joke. Most of you don't know me, but that, that was a joke. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, that the I I do use Maimonides uh, steps in working with folks. Um, that you can't atone unless you have asked for forgiveness. You know, that that, that has to be part of the process, that self-forgiveness is part of the process. Um, but I think uh, one conversation stands out to me, um, again, from my time at, at boot camp. I saw a lot of recruits at boot camp. So, uh, but um, this guy was having uh, just real, um, it was really weighing on him that he had been present in the house when a friend of his was assaulted by a third party. And it was really weighing on him that he had not done anything, that he had not done more, that he had all of those things. And we talked a lot about the notion that uh, he can certainly ask her for forgiveness, he felt like he had wronged her 
um, but that he also needed to forgive himself mm -hmm. and that he needed to take this weight uh, and, tr and do something good with it, right? He needs to fix the world in the way he feels he's broken the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so this would be another example of that uh, that I mentioned earlier, but he needed to, you know, and he, in a military setting, you know, one of the things I suggested for him was not immediately because you have to be a little bit more senior to do it, but perhaps he becomes the person doing the sexual assault prevention training. Uh, we have a mechanism for that here, uh, or we have a pathway for that here, um, that he would perhaps do uh, other sorts of sexual assault prevention things uh, because he feels like he didn't stop this one and he broke the world somehow. So this is how he can fix the world. Um, to which I would add, uh, if I may, uh, that, and I can because I'm already talking, uh, that that notion that the world is constantly broken and constantly fixed, uh, I think is uh, that we, we called earlier, put it under the rubric of tikkun olam, uh, which is the, um, the notion that the world is crooked and somebody's got to straighten it out. And it falls on each of us to be that person to straighten it out. Uh, and so that way of seeing the world is quite different from everyone else is perfect and I messed up, or everyone else does right, and I screw things up. No, guess what? We're all messing up all the time, and we're all required to fix all the time. Right. Um, and that ongoing, that notion of, of ongoing breaking and repair, I find very powerful. I was thinking about how valuable that could be, both when a, uh, a veteran returns home, and um, may well be in therapy with a spouse um, uh, and a challenge of dealing with what haunts, what likely haunts that veteran. How can war not haunt one? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, being able to feel um, fully able to re enter that relationship um, as a whole person. Um, um, but I, I, and I, I anyway, I, I was thinking about how powerful um, that that um, transformation, that transition could be, also for clergy um, with whom they might choose to speak. I think it's also a pretty powerful um, strategy within veteran circles, uh, where um, honesty is uh, gradually built one with the other and increasing candor and then um, mutual uh, offering of new possibilities uh, with a veteran. I, I wondered if um, um, how you have, any of you have used this concept of city of refuge. It's, sort, it's, it's so powerful and I, I'm interested um, again in, in how you might've already been using this, say with a veteran or um, an active duty person. Well, for me, the connection is the, is the intent, mm -hmm. right? And discussing the intent behind, uh, the, there's no changing that someone has, is dead. Whether, whether that person was intentionally killed or not, that doesn't change. So that's the reality we need to deal with. And part of the rules about the city of refuge is that they're, they're, that is dealt with. There is restitution that has to be made. The, uh, but, the intention behind the action that caused the death, that's really what matters. And that's really, uh, that's what allows or doesn't allow someone access to the city of refuge. And so uh, that to me is, is an important factor in discussing some, a wrong that's been done, uh, not to excuse or to explain away or to anything like that, but if it, you're gonna be in this situation again, how do we make sure you don't go down the same path? That notion. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would yeah. add- And also, go ahead. Go ahead, Kim I, and then Nancy. I would add to that, 
You know, the city of refuge, cities of refuge were in part designed to protect unintentional manslayers from, from vengeful family members of the, the one who had been killed. Understandably so, but um, to protect that, that person um, from uh, physical harm and retaliation. And so I think it, it sort of leads to the question, what are, what are mechanisms that could be put in place to offer similar protections um, to somebody in, the, in, in that situation? Um, I mean, what, what creatively could that look like? to create kind of um, uh, like a, a shelter for the person um, while they are healing or in a process of, of recovery to protect them from the worst, um, the, the, the worst injuries um, on top of what they're already wrestling with their own guilt or shame or, yeah. or whatever, right. and how that, those could be somehow um, concretized. Right. Nancy, you wanted to jump in, I think. In many ways, these are sanctuary cities, right? Yeah. So it's how we create sanctuary for people. Right. Um, and one of the ways I understand the cities of refuge and the message for the person who is sheltered there is that God doesn't want two lives to be unnecessarily lost. And so we do everything we can to create the environment so that the one who is still alive is fully alive right. and contributing and active and engaged in the world again. And that that person knows that not only the people in that city of sanctuary or refuge are engaged in that, but that the entire community understands themselves as being responsible for making sure that place exists and right. that it exists with all of the resources that are necessary for that person and everybody else in the community to thrive. When I think about that point, and I'm so glad you elaborated it, um, I think one of, one of my concerns and hopes um, is that more congregations can become um, informed and reflective about roles that we can play with the veterans who sit among us I'm often not choosing to talk about what they carry, um, though occasionally they may share with a pastor uh, or a, a rabbi or a mom what a burden it is. And, and so I think that that image of congregations, communities of faith as cities of refuge um, is an extraordinarily helpful metaphor. And We've got about- to me, yes, Emily? Nancy, and maybe you've- already thought about this or other folks have already thought about this, but um, Kim, you mentioned that one of the purposes of the cities of refuge is to protect the unintentional manslayer from the vengeful family. But in the situation of moral injury, it's often the man, unintentional manslayer who is the vengeful party. Yeah. Right, who's the worst uh, right? So the other question is not themselves. just, yeah. right, how do we protect people from themselves? Exactly. Um, and give yeah. them a way to unburden that weight um, without taking a second life. Yeah. And actually Maimonides addresses that and says that one of the um, attributes of a city of refuge is they have no, um, none of the materials that can contribute to creating weapons mm -hmm. because of both right. the person who might come after the person who sought refuge, but also to save the person from themselves. So. Um, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful text. It's, it's in our shared, um, our, our shared uh, scripture. Um, and I think well worth using as, um, as, as a teaching opportunity um, for both those in seek of care and those providing it uh, as well. As well as the texts um, for the returning warriors. Yeah. You know, the whole right. process of you don't just walk back in and everything's fine. I, one, uh, one more thing about this, and then a, I hope a brief time about um, Sedeka, but I'm, I'm mindful of, of um, veterans, um, active duty Captain Beth Stalinga and, and veteran Michael Yandel, who have both urged congregations to be mindful that in our democracy, um, we citizens um, 
vote for the persons who declare war? Mm -hmm. And how might we reflect uh, on our complicity um, for those who come home? Right. I'm wondering if, I, if any of you has engaged the Sedeca with um, persons in your care re related to moral injury. Well, as I, as I mentioned, I, I, I use the idea of, uh, of receiving Sadaka, but also giving it, being required to give it um, in the context of a, a, a group therapy or a group mm -hmm. talk uh, session. Um, and I, I, I think that, that that notion that even if one is receiving assistance, one also has to give assistance. I think mean, it is very empowering. Mm -hmm. um, and just remind it, it's I think respects the humanity of the recipient of tzedakah that you're not you're not just living off of other people you're also giving. And there are certainly many examples in the realm of political and social activism where we can see the ways that veterans are giving back and making the world a fairer place. Mm -hmm. um, from their perspective by the engagement that they have in different community and international um, actions. So. From, from the smallest to the, to the largest actions, one of the things that um, I was uh, astonished and so moved to learn about early on in my reading about moral injury were about, was about um, a small number, but very meaningful number of um, Vietnam veterans who chose to go back to Vietnam and live there. Um, and to try to rebuild um, a country that they felt um, so much guilt for having had a hand in causing so much destruction. I mean, that's, you know, that's a far end of the spectrum in terms of Sadaka, um, but it can be as small, again, as we said, as um, just a, a monetary contribution to an organization that provides services to, um, to veterans, or to others who are, you know, similarly suffering, um, and the, you know, the spectrum is very, very wide, and there really is there's something for everybody really that can be done. The other example of that I would give would be the recent um, efforts by Afghanistan veterans of Af of the war in Afghanistan to uh, find and facilitate the um, the evacuation of their connections there. Um, I think that, yeah. 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 We've come to the end of our time. And I, I remember that you, um, you wanted to share a particular um, parting uh, word. I, I do want to speak with deep gratitude. And I'm so grateful that also that this um, webinar will be available for the many chaplains and clergy that I hope will, um, will view the wisdom you've shared with us today. But now I invite you to close us as you had suggested. So I would like to share the screen again. And one second. <laughs> There's a midrash uh, rabbinic story that goes as follows. Rabbi Judah bar Lakish taught that two arcs journeyed with Israel in the wilderness, one for the whole set of tablets, the Torah, and one for the broken pieces, the ark in which the Torah was placed was kept in the tent of meeting, but the one containing the broken pieces from when Moses first came down and threw down the Ten Commandments would come and go with the people. From this, we infer that the broken tablets were even more treasured by the people. They took them with them wherever they traveled, just as all of us take the broken parts of ourselves wherever we go. And then one day, both sets were brought to the land of Israel and placed together in the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem. Rabbi Alexandri said, if an ordinary person uses a broken vessel, it is shameful. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy Blessed One, uses only broken vessels. Karov Adonai L'mishbarei Lev, God draws close to those whose hearts are broken. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. This was really quite remarkable. I'm very grateful to you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Peace.